Welcome everyone to the Conscious Woman podcast. Today we're having a very special conversation with Aditi Shola Purkar, who is the co-founder of a finance app, which we will talk more about shortly, that helps women both build and manage their wealth consciously. So excited to, to get into this conversation with you, Aditi, because it is definitely such an important one, especially for women, I think. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Oh, my, my absolute pleasure to be here. All right. Aditi, I want to start with something powerful I've actually heard you say in another interview, I think. You said something along the lines of, if as a woman you have no money, you have no voice. Say more about that because that's a powerful statement. So, you know, I would I would love to take credit for that. To be honest, it's it's not mine. It's one of the amazing women that we interviewed when we set out to build SALT. So just, you know, we, we'll talk more about SALT later. But in short, we're three women co-founders. And so obviously our entire lives and our sort of lived experience has been about this but but maybe just for the sake of rigor or maybe because you know we didn't want to be caught up in our own perceived sort of life experiences we were like okay let's let's validate this hypothesis like what really is the issue with women and money like what's the disconnect is this a solution looking for a problem and so we interviewed a lot of women before we finally decided, okay, we're doing this, we're building salt. And these were interviews that, you know, we would set up as like 20, 30 minute conversations, and then they would end up being like an hour, hour and a half long. And it was just cathartic. Women would open up, like, like imagine a stranger, someone who you started talking to 30 minutes ago, thanking them for their time and, you know, being a little bit formal. And 45 minutes in, they're telling you about, Everything from like childhood traumas to like turning points to like, you know, toxic relationships they had to stay in because of, you know, money and, and obviously there were great stories too, right? There were stories of people just really, uh, you know, turning their life around the common thread, there being money. And what you kept hearing again and again was different versions of the same thing. One woman very articulately put it as, you know, if you have no money, you have no voice. Um, but there were other such brilliant gems. So I remember, you know, someone telling us about how she grew up, how her parents' relationship with money was. And she said something so smart. She said, you know, my mom made the four-figure decisions and my dad made the five-figure decisions and upwards. And if you think about it, that is so true. In fact, I loved that, you know, when you introduced me you didn't use the word oh they're building an app that's going to educate women blah 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 because nothing nothing bothers me more than when people just assume that if you're building something for women and money it is to educate them women do not need to be educated about money i i feel like everyone knows that i don't know why we keep saying it but i i think you know going back to those stories the common thread was that money unfortunately or fortunately is obviously synonymous with power but it's also synonymous with respect right and it's not just in the external world it's even within the household right how you're perceived what's your what your rights are how your time is valued how your contribution is valued and i i think our biggest takeaway from that because you know just so that the experiment was kosher we interviewed men and women and we interviewed people from all over the world not just india obviously money is a very emotional subject for a lot of people but it is so much more deeply emotional for women than it is for men and and it even it, it translates into the kind of things you hear so um, men would typically relate money to things that they can do mm -hmm. uh, i think money is important because it allows me to do the things i love or allows me to get this or that women would always relate money to the things they feel and the very core of their identity and again now when i think back to it i'm like yeah that's that's so obvious but you know hearing it verbalized by i don't know 500 and more women that was pretty magical yeah and in fact i love that about how you frame your work that it it's not so much about giving women power or empowering women because 
you're right. Uh, women have had a relationship with money for generations. I think we can all point to mothers and grandmothers who skillfully managed the family wealth and helped to grow the family wealth. So yes, I think I, I, I love what you say about women already having this intuitive sense yes. and agency around money. Share with us more insights that came from that in terms of what, what are some of the inherent strengths women already have when it comes to, to money and finance? Well, so many. In fact, it was, it, it, it was actually crazy. I think, you know, the process of building salt has obviously been, you know, transformative the way execution always is. But I think those first six months of really just opening your eyes and seeing things that you've been living through but somehow haven't ever consciously recognized was I, I think for, for us you know those first six months were priceless so for example you're absolutely right in fact you used a word their agency right that's how we started describing what we did women have an inherent acumen for money we are just helping them reassert their agency over it and we we danced around this a lot because exactly we hated words like help and empower and you know all of those things and i think reassert their agency was the one that came closest because that's literally what it is right you, you, you're bang on that you know our our mothers and their mothers have always been just so good at one obviously sequestering money because at that time that was all that was sort of available but in whatever way possible also also growing it my co-founder chetra has a lovely story of how you know the the, the village that her mom comes from had a self-help group where these women would save you know 10 rupees every month over years and years and years and how that compounded and paid for multiple children's educations kids who now work all over the world in apple and mercedes benz and so on and so forth and i mean it's just amazing right so i i do think that women and the reason i'm calling this out is because I, I do think that it's the polite thing to always acknowledge how good women are at saving and sequestering and people very conveniently forget that whenever given even the most bare minimum resources to do more than that, they've grabbed that opportunity with both hands. So women are actually good at cultivating money, using money as a tool. And I think that's an inherent strength. Another thing, and this is a it, it, it's so funny some of these things that you know you end up researching when you formally do something so that very popular narrative of oh my god women are risk averse right and fortunately now enough people are saying oh women aren't risk averse women are risk aware and i was like i i really want to know how this started right like how this started and so I, I dug and i dug and i dug and i realized long ago there was a a paper written i think in scientific american or one of these sort of very you know psychology oriented publications and it did not say that at all in fact it's so sad that this is what we took away from it what it said was very simply that when men perceive risk and reward they gravitate towards the highest value reward right so the the shiniest thing and as a result they're willing to take more risk to get that shiniest thing even if it's a lower probability reward as long as it's a high value reward they gravitate to it women inherently are better than doing that entire expected probability math in their head to say value of reward into likelihood of reward right and if you think about it that is so scientific that is so amazing that is literally how fund managers manage billions and billions and billions of AUM, right? It's a cultivated strategy. It's what you're taught to do in investment banks and in hedge funds. And women are born with that. Women are born with that inherent ability to literally multiply the value of a reward with the probability of its occurrence. And that is called risk awareness. And somehow through through the ages that got simplified down to saying women are risk averse. Just the other day I was, you know, reading somewhere that, oh my God, did you know the human brain is amazing? Every time we so much as throw a ball to hit a target, our brain is doing complex math around velocity and so on and so forth. And I was like, every time women think about a decision, our brain is doing the complex math around, you know, risk and reward and probability and expected outcome, yet nobody celebrates that. So, I mean, there's so many more. I could go on and on. This would need to be a three-hour podcast. I completely agree. In fact, I think I've also seen studies that actually 
show that female fund managers actually generate outsized returns in comparison to their male counterparts. So this idea of framing women as risk aware rather than risk averse, that I think reframing alone is, is so empowering and reassuring. So given Aditi, given we, we have all these strengths we bring to the table, we have this intuitive sense around risk and reward, what's getting in the way? Because I know you also, you're also framing your work as closing the gender gap in finance. So what, what how has this gender gap emerged? And, and what's, what's really getting in the way right now? So look, three things, right? The first one, and again, this is something that I think my, my, so like I said, right, with three co-founders and it was actually Shinjini and Chaitra, my co-founders that sort of articulated this so beautifully the first time. They said that the cost of mistakes for women is always higher. It's always at a different magnitude. And, and think about like cost of mistakes for anything, right? It could be the cost of wearing something that you wanted to wear and you know walking on a street alone at night and the way that's framed is your fault or you know the cost of going in public transport unchaperoned like just the cost of mistakes for women is such a such a grim thing in this world and sometimes even with the best of intentions the cost of mistakes end up and ends up being the thing taken away from you so for example i'll use the same from public transport example right you went in public transport unsupervised doesn't happen a lot in singapore happens way too much in india something untoward happened what's the next thing that happens you're told hey you know what don't travel alone someone will always go with you there that's you know your wings getting clipped one at a time the fact that engineer always says this wheels are the difference boys get wheels i still remember when i wanted to be an engineer I, it, it was just a passing thought, but I was like, oh, maybe I should go to Kota and study variety. And I know a lot of girls do that, but just my parents were just too scared to, you know, send me to a city to live alone. And so all of these things add up, right? Even when people are trying to protect you and well, they're, when they're not trying to protect you, you can only imagine. I think second is the fact that it's not expected of you. Unfortunately, and, and this is the part that, you know, really, truly baffles me and because traditionally like let's say you know before the internet hundreds of years ago right women were managing household money right the whole hunter and gatherer so let's say the man was hunting women were gathering and nurturing so the women were managing household money somewhere and maybe it's because history is largely written by men you know the books that shape the narrative of history the research it's all so male-centric and some amazing work has been done on this by the way how data on women has just gotten erased out of history but somehow this whole narrative that formal finance is the man's domain so the fact that it's not expected of you the fact that when little girls were being raised maybe 40 50 years ago it actually wasn't an expectation that they would be completely independent and manage money on their own, right? E even right now, I think, unfortunately, things are improving. But even right now, I know that parents would worry a little bit more, in fact, significantly more, if their son didn't know how to file their taxes versus if their daughter didn't know how to file her taxes. That's just a thing. So I think it's the nearest male relative syndrome, right? Because it's not expected from a woman, at the first sign of distress, she would end up outsourcing this to the nearest male relative like oh my god it's too complicated why don't you do it for me and again this relates to you know cost of mistakes maybe she's so afraid of making a mistake that she'd rather give up that bar and i think the last one and it's a little bit related is that there's nobody to emulate and, and these are also interrelated but we in our early interviews spoke to a lot of women and this wasn't by design just ended up happening who'd been brought up by single mothers right mothers who because of a sudden sort of loss of a spouse had to take care of just everything right making money keeping money just building the nest egg and those girls typically grew up a lot more in charge of money why because they had that woman to emulate and that woman did it purely out of necessity but these women had somebody to emulate or just someone who works with me at salt um 
her parents when she and her brother were young like literally i think 3 or 4 years old told them okay i'm going to teach you how banking works i'm going to give you money and if you give this money back to me every 6 months i'm going to give you 2 rupees of interest i love that they expected the same thing from the son and the daughter the daughter by the way today is a finfluencer and a really good one in that so yeah i i think it's it's at its very core it is i think some combination of these things that is getting in the way I think what you said about the society in general being less forgiving of the of the mistakes women make does instill this legitimate fear in in women because if I if I look at the workplace I see something similar happening when it comes to for example women negotiating for 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 their salaries and truly asking for what they are worth many times i think the myth is women are 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 not asking for more because they feel they're not deserving of more actually it's many times it's because of this fear of the of is there going to be am i going to be negatively judged if yeah. i ask for more so it's this fear of backlash that that holds us back so i'm i'm curious because i think part of consciously building our wealth has to come from us us really asserting that power in that way in the workplace and beyond how do we begin this process of of making these shifts at an individual level as well as a societal level so we can reclaim this power i you know i mean that's obviously that observation is bang on and i wish that was a way to say that hey if we do these three things that this will get fixed it's so deep rooted that you're right it's going to need changes at an individual level societal level and honestly generally the participation of more women in the workplace which means more hiring managers being women as well i for the longest time did not realize this and then once i became a people manager i started seeing the difference as clear as night and day in the way men and women negotiate for money I think men uh, you know i've said this before so this is going to be a bit repetitive but i think it's the core instinct of i do the math versus you do the math so when men come and ask you for something it's typically hey i'm going to shoot my shot there they're less afraid of being rejected they're less afraid of hearing okay you're just crazy they're just less afraid in general and their job is to tell you what they want and then you do the math right you figure out in your head as my hiring manager or as the you know person in hr that i'm talking to how you can get close to that am i am i you know deserving of that and so on and so forth but my job is to just give you my ask women unfortunately uh I come from a very strong i do the math mindset where even before they get to the table they've just countered themselves 1 million times and they've just lowballed themselves even before they get to their table so if this is my ask i'm almost negotiating myself down and being like oh but you know my peers are probably making this oh but you know i my experience is x y z and you know they're it just it's crazy that's that linkedin study where men were applying for jobs where there was as little as a 30% skill set match and women were shy of applying to jobs even if there was a 90% and upward skill set match right that that literally speaks to the same mindset where women have already just negotiated away half of their ask in their own minds before they get to the table honestly i'm not saying that one way is right or wrong in a completely let's say we were to rewrite the universe from scratch i'm not necessarily sure i'd say that oh the former is better right? but that's how things have been done that's how workplaces have become workplaces unfortunately are still you know male dominated hiring managers most often tend to be male and if this is what people have gotten used to the person that's already underballing themselves unfortunately will get the short end of the stick so even though it's not It, it's an instinct that i think we just women, we as women just have to override we have to get over just you know negotiating against ourselves in our own minds and i think the other important shift that needs to happen is that you know what are you asking for think valuing your time skills and experience 
is the minimum that's where any money negotiation needs to start right this is what i'm worth the minimum and anything over and above that is what we negotiate or that's the that's the you know i think on the cake women unfortunately end up making that at the end goal you should be starting from the point of valuing these three things and negotiating keeping these are the three things you have in your arsenal women treat that as the end point where again men more often than not start from like a 10 to 20% you know premium on these points and i think the last one and this is squarely in the sort of you know organizations or hiring managers domain it's so easy to underball the person who's asking for less and succumb to the person who's just asking for more um usually when you're hiring you're always under a deadline you're always going to want to close fast but this is something organizations need to do consciously that when someone's asking for too much money of course you tell them hey you're asking for too much money we can't afford it but when someone's asking for too little money how often do people actually come forward and say that hey we actually think this is fair you know for given your job description or given you know your role description or given what you bring to the table and i that that has to happen and i feel like that won't happen unless there are more women in these decision making places so yeah i mean two out of three things i think are just things that all of us can do better but i do think that we will need a little bit of a steadying hand from the from the other side i'm also curious what your own journey has been like how you have grown more comfortable in your relationship with money and looking back what stands out to you as you know something you have unlearned in a good way when it comes oh. to beliefs around money oh okay so uh, this is again you know it's it's funny how many things in hindsight seem so obvious to you and this is one of those things right so i started my career in in, in global markets so in sales and trading i i would say probably the most technical aspect of finance that there is right or one of the most and i stayed so started with bank of america did equities post mba went on to city and did fx my mba again so like i i went to i am amdavad very few women fewer women who chose finance as their career very very small peer group and i remember people being stunned when i got replacement of workers i mean how could no one says it but they're basically stunned that a girl was the first person to get a replacement offer from an investment bank and and that's always there in the background you may hate it but it's there in your in your mind so you almost know that the expectation was for you to fail and you somehow succeeded and only looking back do you realize how insidious that is right it just stays in your mind you may not act on it you may not react to it but it stays in your mind that everyone was in general expecting you to fail and the fact that you succeeded was such a revelation that people it's almost like oh let, let's see how how long you can last and what happens is that then you enter the workplace like that so again my workplace post b school was pretty much all men in fact um you know one of one of the people that influenced my career in the most positive way happened to be a woman and the only reason she did that was because in that room full of very just high testosterone extremely abusive men she was one woman who was fantastic brilliant good at her job all without the need to just you know scream and yell and be all alpha about it and these are things you realize in hindsight how even before you entered the dealing room you lost half the battle because you were like oh yeah i'm supposed to fail what's happening here is an exception and so even though i was in literally the thick of possibly the most technical aspect of finance i still felt like a poser i felt like all the men around me on their trading terminals were the real deal and i on my trading terminal was just like one mistake away from being exposed and it was crazy and in fact i remember also getting this feedback that oh you're you're technically so sound you're you know you know your stuff better than most you know senior traders but we just we just never hear you yell 
do you really care because you know trading is all about just like yelling and shouting in aggression and i was literally asked this we never hear you yell do you really care about this job is this interesting to you and at that time i actually thought wow that's you know that's crazy but again somewhere you know you carry that with you and it was finally when i moved out of investment banking i joined ptm it was a complete sort of it was a completely new world right fintech completely retail focused here i was you know talking to hedge funds and large institutional clients millions and millions of dollars in a day and here i was thinking about you know how to make the journey for a customer smoother when they you know would probably not even transacting or giving me any revenue it was a complete shift in perception and it was in that environment and i still remember it was a friend it was a male friend actually who was like oh so wait you don't invest your own money and i remember at the time making an excuse that oh you know in in in, in trading compliance is so hard blah 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 but i realized at the end of the day i had no confidence i had done literally one of the hardest things in finance that there was to do i had done it well for four years and i had absolutely no confidence in my innate abilities and i remember even in that environment being surrounded by again men who had no professional training nothing close to what i had and i would hear them trading stock tips and trading just investment whatever advice which obviously didn't fundamentally make sense to me but almost feeling rather than thinking oh my god they don't know what they're talking about almost coming from a place of oh my god i don't know what they're talking about so crazy how you can just like do this to yourself but i think it was that conscious push from that one friend into are you crazy get out of your head right like literally someone kicking you into action for then your you know natural intelligence and instinct and you know whatever to take over and of course even after that it it's a it's a learning process right when i used to you know deal with client money there's a there are guard rails to make sure you're doing things a certain way with your own money all bets are off you are allowed to do stupid things you are able to do stupid things of course i've done my share of stupid things i've also done a lot of smart things but i think what really helped was that i did it myself i made those mistakes i felt shitty that i made those mistakes i remember buying stuff or making investments just because it was hyped up even though somewhere i knew better and i remember coming out of those mistakes and learning those lessons i also remember doing the opposite not doing something that i knew was intelligent because someone else said oh the rally is over i still remember this i was like hey i think i should invest now and someone said oh you know what the rally is over now when i think of it the market's like 200 percentage points up just it's crazy right so i think doing it myself whether good or bad has been sort of the the biggest it's made the biggest difference and if you ask me the one thing that i unlearned it was just like stop batting against myself i think it's the one thing that i feel like all women do when it comes to money they are so quick to think that they're deficient that they're the problem and if someone like me who was literally a trader who was literally selected to do this from like thousands and thousands and thousands of people could still feel like that i completely understand why you know other women who don't work in finance would feel like that so yeah, yeah i can imagine thanks for sharing that i i think you're right this you know this can spark so many fears and this whole process of of our relationship with money is fraught with so many can be fraught with so many disempowering thoughts and beliefs as well so what would you say aditi are some some small shifts or some behavioral changes we can make that will set us on the right course and get us feeling more comfortable for example you know being more comfortable with talking about money with our with our girlfriends or with our with our with our family members just other other mindset shifts that we can make that just will allow us to take more ownership of this journey i th- i think you know mindset shifts yes and also small action so you're absolutely right right having that peer group is so important for me it was that one friend back at paytm but since then i've been that one friend for a lot of my girlfriends so i think always having that support group or not even a support group just a peer group a cohort a water cooler friend a work friend literally anyone 
where you talk about money is so important and and women somehow are super shy when it comes to talking about money it it's so funny you know some of my closest friends have asked me for like like let's say salary negotiation advice and they're so scared to tell me you know where they're currently at or what they want to be making we're so scared of you know saying numbers i i do feel like you know that that's something we have to get out of one of the reasons why women are typically more informed when it comes to just benchmarking compensation compared to men is because they're so awkward when it comes to talking real numbers the second and you know it's going to sound boring it's it's going to sound like eat your vegetables it's very difficult for someone to wake up one day and be like i am going to start investing and make 10 to 20% returns in a year that's just not i mean if it happens great but that's that's less likely start with the admin things okay start with the small boring admin things because guess what the margin of error is low i i tell this to literally every young person and specifically young women i meet please file your own taxes please file your own taxes there are websites there are ways for you to just people have made it easy enough that any reasonably smart person you know knows how to use a computer can do it file your own taxes the first time you'll be confused you will need to ask people for help but you'll be amazed at how empowering it is and you know what's the worst that can happen you'll over file or you'll under file you'll over pay or you'll under pay and it'll get fixed right it's a very it's a very low risk thing to get started with or something that you know my mom did so she had this realization a few years back oh my god i don't know anything about the money and a very simple thing she just sat with my dad and asked him to you know show her so okay what insurance policies do we have what are the different bank accounts that we have so on and so forth uh, for her just logging into net banking herself was a big first step to so start with these admin things they may sound boring you know it, it's like if you ever notice when it comes to like fitness and dieting we never say oh i want to become just a little bit healthier over the next 6 months we say i want six pack abs in the next one month because that's the sexy goal and and that's kind of what we do with money where we're like i'm going to start investing and you know what's going to happen you're most likely going to start more often than not you're going to lose a little bit of money or you're suddenly going to get jolted out of it and then you're going to get scared and you're never going to do it again so start slow start with eating your vegetables start with doing these little admin things you'll be amazed at the kind of just confidence you will get when you'll understand these things you'll already be better than 80% of the people and then start slowly today fortunately when it comes to investing there's so many sort of you know beginner friendly options right there there's mutual funds there's literally like index funds like it's it's so easy right here do you think india is going to do well great invest in a nifty 50 fund right simple things like health insurance for example so many so many women aren't part of the health insurance purchase decision making that decision is typically made by a male member of the family and when they have a baby or you know when unfortunately let's say the the more you know certain types of cancers happen that's when you realize how bad your health insurance was for you know you as a woman right so i think taking care of these small things is a very good first step to the ultimate six pack abs equivalent of finance that that you want to get eventually yes and i think the uh, the only other thing i would add which we found to be supremely valuable in our work is given that a lot of women are purpose driven i think even when it comes to building one's wealth having a clear purpose around why you're choosing to do this and how what are the conscious goals you would want to work towards like for me for example i don't care to spend money on on things like design of clothing or 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 fashion in in any sense and of course no judgment to to those who choose to do that for me education learning is something i will spend freely spend money on for myself for my family so having i think that clarity helps and i think also to your earlier point around how we fall prey to those biases whether they're driven by society or those internal biases that kill our confidence being value led i find is 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 very helpful and i'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well so you know it's it's so funny because i 
I feel like this is one of those sort of double-edged swords, right? I remember when I was just starting out in my investment banking and whatever phase, I honestly wasn't purpose-driven in the sense of money. As in, I was purpose-driven that, oh, I want to be great in my job and I want to be so good. But I didn't have life goals, right? You're, you're so young. Like, what are your life goals going to be? You're too young to buy a house. You don't have, like, you know, whatever, like, kids, pets, whatever, any thing or anyone that you care about that that you have to provide for right i was fortunate enough to not have student debt so again and because i was not purpose driven in that sense it became a very easy excuse to do nothing and that is you know what i like to think of as the purpose pitfall a lot of us become purpose driven a little bit later in life and it's it's great because when that happens, you're suddenly like, like you just said, right? You're so driven when it comes to learning. But a lot of us aren't purpose driven for a really long time. Or maybe those are purposes that we can't directly connect to money. And so then that ends up being almost this weird grace period that we give ourselves where we're like, oh, yeah, I, I don't I don't need money for dash, which is why I will do nothing, right? What, what I would... And again, I mean, there's so many things that I want when it comes to women and money. But I would really want, you know, women to start thinking of money just in general as a as a tool, right? Where just for the sake of it, right? Like, like think of it like this. Your, your mind and body, you will not let them lie idle. If you're, even if you have no work, let's say you don't have to earn a living and you have literally no work, you don't have to cook, you don't have to do anything, will you feel okay that you're just sitting in a chair or lying in bed all day long? You're going to know something's wrong because you have a brain and you have a body and they're meant to be used. Yes, maybe for a purpose, but even if you don't have a purpose, just because they will literally atrophy if they're not used. We have to start thinking of money the same way. Money is supposed to be doing something all the time. It is supposed to be growing and not be idle because your purpose might come later but you had money before and that money just just lying idle is is i mean if it's if it's not doing anything it's diminishing in value right yes there are technical ways to explain that inflation blah 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 but very simply we need to start thinking of money as something that needs to be just doing something for us all the time even while we're asleep and so even before you have a goal you have to have that mindset shift towards money. That if I'm making money, it shouldn't just be lying there. It should be earning something, right? Because otherwise, it's getting eroded in value. And you know what? There is going to be a time in my life and I'm going to have a goal. And I'm going to be so happy that I started early. I, I think that's th this is one change that has happened in me since I've started SORT. Because I've realized that this, this pitfall of like, not immediately having that purpose or knowing that purpose costs women a lot of time in terms of years men i've noticed don't have this need for a purpose when it comes to doing money things and i, I think you were right because women are so purpose driven we connect men don't have that need they do it for the sake of it which is why they get that massive head start and then what ends up happening is women lose that first five ten years and then they start feeling like oh my god i'm late to the party everyone knows all these things and i don't and you know why should i even start now and da, 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 da. so yeah it again this needs to be in the category of you know just eat your vegetables that that's a great point actually that yes you're right until we get that clarity around what are those goals that we would want to spend money on you you also don't want that to be a detriment to exactly. not taking action now Exactly. Um, very true. Aditi, when we look at the future of work for women, one of the, the things that a lot of studies are pointing to is that we are going to see more women going into entrepreneurship. You're going to see more freelancers, more you know, small businesses, etc. So for for those kinds of of for those kinds of professions or that line of work where you don't have a stable source of income coming in per se. 
are are there are there any any differences one should be mindful of or how how should that category of women be thinking of so you know one thing that if if let's say you're not a typical salaried individual there are certain things that you need to cover your bases on so for example typically if you have an employer you have health insurance right whereas if you're a free, freelancer chances are you you don't so just getting your bases covered in terms of basics like health insurance you know if you have dependents then then life insurance right those are things that you need to be just a little bit i don't even want to say extra conscious because it's not something you have to do all the time you have to do it once and then that's it i think the second thing that becomes really important is knowing that you're not going to have that x money comes in every month kind of life so you're going to have that some months it's going to be like 0.2x and some months it's going to be like 3x but your the nature of your needs is going to be a lot more constant so i think just a better system of saying this is my let's say emergency fund right so at any time i know that if let's say covid happened and so no social events for a while so many wedding photographers makeup artists etc who happen to be women suddenly saw their income stream dry up right salaried individuals to a large extent suffered lesser but those women suddenly like there were no wedding so who was getting their makeup done professional there were no events so it becomes i i think everyone should have an emergency fund but i think for anyone who doesn't have that assured you know salary coming in every month you need to be very conscious about having an emergency fund that covers your expenses for you know ideally 12 months but you know at least at least 6 to 9 months for sure and and i think because your the money coming in is going to sort of you know go up and down you do need to be a little bit more disciplined about saving and investing so for example one thing that salaried people do very often is they start these sips right oh every month my salary comes and then x amount gets deducted and you know goes into an sip now it's very easy for someone who's a freelancer to get into that trap of oh no i don't know if money's coming in this month so how can i have but you are going to have savings right you are so even if it's 500 rupees even if it's 5000 whatever it is right don't not let yourself get into that discipline just because the inflow isn't assured honestly i think i, I don't think there's a very different rule book okay these are just some small things women need to do a little more consciously well anyone who who's you know in a, a freelancer but women specifically and i think lastly this is not so much related to um specifically things you do with your money in terms of investing etc but again something we learned in the course of our early interviews we were talking to this woman who coincidentally happened to be in the same batch as me at city in a different part of the bank and then she left to pursue her calling as a you know travel vlogger photographer you know so on and so forth and she said something very interesting she said you know for me spending money to buy a really good dslr or a really good laptop is an investment because these are the tools of my trade right so it's it's very easy to fall into the trap of scrimping on literally the tools of your trade but that is something freelancers and again specifically women because i think we tend to be more inherently frugal need to not fall into right like like i always think back to my the, the first i think the makeup artist that i worked with for my wedding obviously she was a freelancer she was just starting out but if you looked at her tools right she had like a 60 piece mac brush set and those were the tools of her trade and she could do magic with that and of course it was crazy expensive but that's an investment you need to make so sometimes money is better spent than saved but you just have to know which is which did he paint a picture for us what is that grand vision that you and your co-founders are working on what is what is the kind of world you want to create okay so all of us say this with different analogies i always use uh, beauty because i just i love that industry i love how that industry has evolved do you remember that around 10 maybe 15 years ago big beauty used to talk down to you right oh, we have five shades of foundation if they don't match you not our problem and what happened then youtube happened and influencers happened and all of a sudden these people um very often women sometimes men sometimes you know non binary individuals 
by and large people who to begin with had been excluded from this mainstream beauty narrative started posting 10 minute 20 minute 30 minute really authentic really genuine tutorials it seems simple enough but look at the ripple effect that happened not only did they build insane followerships they created communities look at the comment section of any youtube tutorial and you see micro communities forming there where people are just like swapping stories what happened then was that suddenly all of these customers right people who had skin conditions people who didn't fall into those five foundation shades people who had texture people you know who were older younger whatever suddenly became visible and these individuals, these influencers, these people who were like you and me, ended up literally starting a movement that bent the will of the entire beauty industry to these customers they had so far been talking down to and so far almost systemically including by always making them feel not good enough. So from a place of these are our five foundation shades today, they're like, look at our inclusive range of, you know, 40 foundation shades. And that just shows you that when when the right voice with the right degree of authenticity is given to the customer, anybody can bend. And that is the world that I see. That is what I see happening to finance. I think for too long, finance has catered to its default customer. That default customer is not a woman for sure. And I think if, if finance has to have a future if formal finance has to have a future has to have a place in people's lives they need to bend they need to change they need to evolve to cater to this customer but like i said that's that's not going to happen without a set of change makers and i i hope that salt is one of those change makers all right amen to that and what would you say aditi is the simplest money habit you would encourage all women adopt today to create this world that you're envisioning okay this is not going to sound glamorous but file your own taxes okay. i promise you if there is one thing that can get you started it is filing your own taxes filing your own taxes creates i think the the endorphin equivalent of doing like a 10 mile hike and reaching the summit and being like oh my god i almost died on the way and i almost thought of giving up but oh my god now that i've done it i feel invincible like where's the next mountain file your own taxes please all right okay i think i'm gonna seriously consider that for myself i usually avoid all paperwork like the plague but i think you you convinced me to uh to take this bold step Aditi, last question for you. What is central to our work of supporting in supporting women to live and lead consciously is being conscious of your values. So I would love to hear from you, Aditi, what are one or two values that are core to the person that you are and how you live and show up each day? Okay, so the, the I, I think something that's been very core to me as a person ever since I've been super little is fairness very often you're told hey the world's not fair you just have to accept it um and and obviously i mean you you don't want to be impractical and you know fight against every little injustice there is but i feel like it's so important to at least strive for fairness right to at least strive for equity if not equality in every aspect and the moment we discard that notion of fairness i think we stop trying to be better we stop trying to make things better we become accepting of just injustice in all its forms and i think for example this whole conversation about you know women and money so much of it doesn't make sense and the right way to deal with it is not to say oh well you know let's just accept it things aren't perfect so i think fairness even though it, it does come at a cost of a little bit of peace of mind has been something very, very core to me. And I think the second value that is super core to me is, is, is tenacity. And what I mean by that is if you have nothing else, right? If you have nothing else, have, have tenacity or develop that muscle. And tenacity is not something you're born with. The very meaning of the word is, you know, something tried repeatedly till you become good at it so many things in life whether it's money whether it's mental health or whether it's physical health whether it's our relationship come down to just showing up right showing up every single day and trying to be a little bit better than we were yesterday so yeah beautiful 
for anyone who's listening to this and would like to know more about your work or take advantage of all the wonderful resources that you have, where would you like to point people to? Awesome. So you should check us out on Instagram at MySaltApp. So it's at the rate M-Y-S-A-L-T-A-P-P. And our website is... Um, salt dot one s a l t dot o n e our app's actually out in beta so you know you can try it out if you check out our insta there is a lot of content we push a lot of our salt stories a lot of the interviews that i told you about are on there it's a very easy way to get in touch with any of us as a company we're just you know very chatty so reaching out to literally me my co-founders anyone in our team is not going to be a problem but yeah well now i have to say i really enjoyed this conversation i mean it was it was genuinely a pleasure. I, I hope that someday we can do a version of this where I also get to listen to you and, uh, you know, yeah. ask you more of these things because this was genuinely, genuinely pleasurable. I'm so glad to hear that, Aditi. Thank you so much. And, and sincerely, all the best to you as you create this world where more women are making more financial decisions because I think that's better for all of us, not just, not just women. And it is that fair world i think to your point on fairness i think that is is part of creating a fair world so all the best and thank you so much for this conversation today thank you so much bye, -bye.